I heard a rustling in some small trees about fifty feet away. Moving about in the dense foliage were two spots of reddish fur. My first impression was of their color, fire-like with reflected sunlight, much darker than any golden lion tamarind I'd ever seen in zoos. Even now, after watching these tamarinds every day, I'm still impressed with their agility and quickness. Hearing their high-pitched bird-like calls coming from the forest gives us all a feeling of excitement and anticipation. Golden lion tamarins are social, squirrel-sized monkeys. One of the most interesting facts about golden lion tamarins is that once a tamarind finds a mate, the bond is usually for life. Together, a tamarind pair will establish a territory in which to raise a family. Twin births are common, and infants are large compared to adults. The father and older siblings help to carry the infants, returning them to their mother to nurse which gives her the chance to produce milk and feed without a double load on her back. Experience gained by older siblings carrying youngsters will be valuable when they become parents themselves. Food sharing is another interesting characteristic of the tamarins. Adults offer or willingly allow their offspring to take food from their hands. A tamarind's diet consists mainly of insects, small animals, and fruit. Brookfield Zoo's Tropic World is a mixed species exhibit where animals live in their natural family groups. This is Flash, the father, and Celia, the mother, with their year-old son, Marty, and two-month-old twins, Maud and Melvin. Here, Marty helps Flash and Celia in the rearing of Maud and Melvin. Tropic World primate keeper Vince Sodaro has cared for Flash and Celia from the time of their pairing. Flash and Celia golden lion tamarins will always stand out in my mind as being among the most endearing of the tamarins that I've worked with. Celia was the first animal that I knew from infancy and who I was able to observe as she matured and reached various milestones in her life, including her eventual pairing with Flash. They had a really good, strong pair bond right from the very beginning. This was obvious to all of us who were present during the introduction because during the very first week, as a pair, they began to go into their nest box at night, which had a sliding door, and they would reach out and slide the door shut behind them for the night. Both of them were excellent parents as well, having succeeded in raising triplets as well as several sets of twins. They were both fiercely protective of their offspring and were excellent about uh, providing food and food sharing with them. Flash was an exemplary father as a golden lion tamarind also, and he would immediately come and relieve Celia of the twins or triplets after they had nursed, and he would carry them. During the first few months of Flash and Celia's time spent together as a pair, they lived in the traditional old-style primate house cage with steel bars, four walls, a few branches provided as perches, and a nest box. It was a very quiet, routine existence for them. All of that changed in 1984 when they were introduced into the Tropic World South America exhibit. Here, for the first time, they found themselves trying to locomote on real live trees with flexible springy branches that would bounce and move in response to their movements. There were other animals in the exhibit to contend with too, including a two-toed sloth that shared the same tree as they did. There were a variety of birds as well, which would fly overhead at unpredictable times, frequently startling them and causing them to bolt for the nest box. It rained several times a day as well. And I think that after several years of having been in the Tropic World exhibit, they had been exposed to a very diverse and somewhat unpredictable environment. And I think that this had to have been a help in preparing the group for their eventual reintroduction. I have to admit that I did have some mixed feelings about hearing that they were going to be released into the wild. 
On the one hand, I was very excited and proud of the fact that the GLT Management Committee thought that we had provided the right environment for this group and that they seemed to have a good social structure and seemed suitable for reintroduction. But at the same time, I was very aware of the many dangers that life in the wild presented to these animals, including predators, possible forest fires, poachers, inconsistent food supplies, and disease. Tropic World at Brookfield Zoo in many ways simulates the wild, but without the difficulties of the forest. For golden lion tamarins to survive in the wild, it would take some training, but more about that later. Golden lion tamarins live in the Atlantic coastal rainforest of Brazil. Once home to thousands of individuals, their numbers dwindled to about 200 by the early 1970s. The Atlantic coastal rainforest once encompassed 10 million acres along Brazil's coast, but because of human activities, only 2% remains. Today, these golden monkeys live in tiny, isolated fragments of forest, mostly on hilltops, as they compete for habitat with farmers who struggle for their own sustenance. I begin my work with golden lime tamarind. In the early 1960s, Brazilian conservationist Dr. Adelmar Coimbra Fio, increasingly concerned about the forest loss and resulting disappearance of tamarins, established the Tijunca Biological Bank, now the Rio de Janeiro Primate Center. This bank has most unusual assets, some of the world's most rare and endangered primates, the miriki, the bearded saki, the pied tamarind, and the golden lion tamarind. Dr. Coimbra hoped to one day reintroduce golden lion tamarinds to their native habitat. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, zookeepers knew little of their natural diet, family structure, or requirements for shelter. In the early 1970s, with only 70 golden lion tamarinds outside of Brazil, research on tamarind behavior conducted by Dr. Deborah Kleiman, director of research at National Zoological Park, led to discoveries that resulted in dramatic improvements in the reproduction and survival of golden lion tamarins in zoos. First, uh, there was a great improvement in the nutrition of the animals in the early 1970s. Once it was realized that uh, they needed higher protein levels in their diet and that um, uh, they shouldn't be fed only fruits. Another set of improvements had to do with uh, their social management. Uh, and that involved the recognition that they bred best as monogamous pairs and nuclear family groups. And that meant not only having only uh, one breeding pair in a cage, but um, ensuring that some of the juveniles born to that pair stayed in the group beyond the birth and rearing of other siblings. Uh, it turned out that uh, juveniles who were not given parental care experience when they were young were poorer parents. Uh, so having uh, good parents re required giving, giving these juveniles the experience. What Dr. Kleiman discovered through behavioral research Really, the recipe for the successful breeding of golden lion tamarins led to a revolution in tamarind care. Sharing her knowledge with other keepers of tamarins led to a golden lion tamarind population explosion. Babies were growing, breeding, and successfully bearing and raising young of their own. But space in zoos to accommodate these animals was quickly disappearing. In the meantime, space was quickly disappearing in the wild as well. In 1974, at the urging of Dr. Coimbra, the last natural refuge for the golden lion tamarind was established by the Brazilian government as the Poço de Santos Biological Reserve. Once they had secured land, Drs. Coimbra, Kleiman, and others developed a strategy to return zoo-born golden lion tamarinds to their native habitat. Golden lion tamarinds and their range had suffered years of neglect. The forest was seen as potential farmland and the tamarins were taken as pets, all of which resulted in less available habitat and fewer breeding golden lion tamarins. The reason that we were sent to Brazil 
Dr. James Dietz was the Golden Lion Tamarin Conservation Program's first field research director. In May 1983, he traveled to Poso de Santos to locate wild tamarins, to survey remaining forest fragments, and to determine what zoo-born tamarins need to survive in the wild. With the wild population of Golden Lion tamarins at a dangerously low level, the historic worldwide collaboration began to repopulate the forest. On May 2, 1984, nine zoo-born golden lion tamarins were reintroduced to their native home. Dr. Bob Lacey, geneticist at Brookfield Zoo, explains why introducing zoo-born tamarins is important to the success of the wild population. Zoos can provide a safety net to prevent the extinction of many species, including the golden lion tamarind. Wild animals are susceptible to many risks. If there's just one population left of a species, then a single catastrophe, such as a forest fire or a disease epidemic, can cause the final and irreversible extinction of an entire species. Additionally, small wild populations are subjected to risks that are not faced by large populations. One of the factors that can imperil small, isolated populations are genetic changes, such as inbreeding depression, and loss of genetic diversity. When the Golden Lion Tamarin Reintroduction Program first started, there were more tamarins in captivity than there were still in the wild. As a result of this, and because the captive matings had been carefully planned, the captive population probably had more genetic diversity, and the animals were probably less inbred than were the wild tamarins. By reintroducing some of the captive tamarins to the wild, we provide the wild tamarins with an opportunity to mate with animals that aren't closely related to them. We also reintroduce some genes to the wild that may have been lost sometime in the past. These genes that we put back in the wild, this additional genetic diversity, is likely to provide variants that might allow for adaptation to diseases or other environmental changes that could occur in the future. In other words, by restoring genetic variability to the wild population, we're providing the tamarins with the best possible chance for surviving into an uncertain future. Zoo-born tamarins are not accustomed to the many difficulties of life outdoors. In zoos, the security of the nest box is never far away. But in the wild, the path leading to the nest box may not be clear. The fruit the tamarins eat in zoos is cut into neat little squares, hardly what they would find in the forest. The first step in the reintroduction process is a training program outdoors on the grounds of the National Zoological Park. One of the scientists who helped establish this program was Dr. Deborah Kleiman. We found that uh, we could train animals before they went to Brazil and that once they got to Brazil, uh, their behavior certainly seemed better with training. Techniques for reintroduction now involve having a group free-ranging uh, in the National Zoo for five to six months before shipment to Brazil. This gives them the opportunity to expand their locomotor abilities and by, by um, uh, having the chance to, to locomote on substrates of various sizes, shapes, and also uh, of varying kinds of flexibility. So they have an opportunity to, to learn that um, during the summer before they are shipped to, to Brazil. They also have the opportunity to gain some experience in searching for foods that are distributed throughout their environment uh, and also being encouraged to forage for, for foods with um, some particular uh, apparatuses that, that we've created that actually force them to, to manipulate, micro-manipulate searching for foods. In order to learn survival skills in anticipation of their eventual reintroduction, Flash, Celia, Marty, Maud, and Melvin were transported from Brookfield Zoo to the National Zoological Park. There, they were given a nest box and allowed to range freely within the park. One of the primary caretakers of the Brookfield group was animal keeper Carol Pima. The, uh, the group of five individuals that were brought here are composed of a, um, an adult male and female. Um, the adult male, his name is Flash, 
And it's kind of ironic that this individual's name would be Flash because um, he's far from being a Flash. Um, this animal was um, very reluctant at first to uh, come out of the nest box and even to date after spending several months here at the zoo has yet to start using the ropes which connect the trees in, in the exhibit. Um, if any one of the individuals tends to hold the family back, it's Flash. Um, the other, the adult females, her name is Celia. Um, she's a typical mom, if you ask me. She, um, she takes, she watches over the family group. She stays close to the nest box. She's not one of them who goes out and, and explores and forages far away from the nest box. And the other uh, three individuals, one's a two-year-old uh, male, uh, his name is Marty, and Marty um, is showing signs of being ready to go on his own. Marty he spends a great deal of time by himself, he forages in the trees by himself, and um, is, is pretty much often um, just not part of the, the group as much as the other animals are. The, the remaining two individuals are Maud and Melvin, and they're twins. And Maud has become a real favorite of our, our volunteers. If there's one word you could use to describe Maud, it would be precocious. She, she's a little devil at times. She's always trying to, to find new ways to, to go places and, and explore new areas. She um, spends a great deal of time going from, from tree to tree, and she, um, at times, has, has uh, keepers need to go on the island for, for various reasons, and uh, we have a, a small boat that we use to get back and forth. And Maud is the one who always tries to, to catch a ride back across the island using the boat. She's, she's a real cutie. The last individual of the group is, is Melvin, and he's one of the twins. He's also one year old. And um, he seems to be a real shy individual. He watches the others, kind of follows along, doesn't initiate a whole lot of activities on his own. It's amazing what difference you see over the months um, in their skills. When they first come, they're very reluctant to leave the area. They're actually quite clumsy at times, um, but they're able to um, their coordination seems to improve, their orientation, how to get from place to place improves, and uh, so all the skills that we're hoping that they develop here is before they're released, um, you can see that gradual change in the group. Early one morning, the Brookfield Zoo family is safely secured in their nest box in preparation for their long journey home. Like much of the state of Rio de Janeiro, the site on which the city of Rio de Janeiro was built was once blanketed by forest. Rio is now one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. The forest has traditionally provided the vast resources necessary to support the population. Animal parts, like this howler monkey jaw, are used for decoration, and primates are sold openly on the streets. Only two hours away is the Poso de Santos Biological Reserve, and the contrast is remarkable. The remnant patches of forest are rich in vegetation so dense that even on the brightest day, the ground under the tree's canopy is dark. The air is filled with the sounds of insects calling, the sweet smell of new growth, and sights of vegetation found nowhere else in the world. But this too can be a hostile environment. Heat and humidity can be oppressive, Mosquitoes are incessant, and heavy rains make travel difficult. To golden lion tamarins, this is home. Upon their arrival, the Brookfield Zoo Group is placed, with its familiar nest box, in an outdoor holding cage next to the reserve headquarters, where they are acclimated to their new surroundings. At National Zoological Park, in order to identify group members easily, 
Each tamarin's tail was marked in a unique pattern. They are also fitted with radio collars so that they will be easier to track once they are released. The collar holds a small radio transmitter which is fitted loosely around the adult tamarins. Experience has shown that juveniles do not stray far from the adults and do not need transmitters. Because of potential health problems, not all members of the tamarin group traveled to Brazil. The adult male, Flash, remained at National Zoological Park. Flash had developed an antibody to hepatitis. This precaution ensured that a hepatitis virus would not be introduced into the forest along with Flash. A new male was therefore needed for Celia. Celia's new mate, called S6, was born in the forest to reintroduce tamarins from the Seattle Zoo. The hope was that if S6 bonded with Celia, he could then lead the group through difficulties they were sure to encounter living in the wild. Dr. Ben Beck is the Associate Director for Biological Programs of the National Zoological Park. He has been the project coordinator for reintroduction of the Golden Lion Tamarin Conservation Program since the first reintroduction. Dr. Beck explains the significance of pairing experienced and inexperienced tamarins, pairing veterans and greenhorns. In which we pair an animal from a previous year's reintroduction with an opposite sexed animal right out of a zoo, a greenhorn. And by being exposed to the veteran, the greenhorns knowledge of the forest, knowledge of food, knowledge of locomotion is accelerated. We're also finding that the young, the babies born to reintroduce parents are learning quickly how to locomote and how to find food so that as our reproduction really begins to crank up, we expect an accelerated rate of success in seeing the reintroduced population grow. Now that Celia had a new mate, attention turned to Marty. Marty had shown signs back at National Zoo of being ready to leave his family and find his own mate. We frequently do not reintroduce an entire family group intact. By having a sub-adult male in this group, who we call B3, I think at Brookfield he was called Marty, who's about two or two and a half years old. We have half of the nucleus of a new group. And in the case of uh, B3, we had actually a very sad situation. The mother and father were stolen out of the forest this year by, um, by poachers for sale in Brazil as pets. This left a young female, a young male, brother and sister, and two two-month-old offspring. The brother and sister raised these two offspring. Now they're about four months old. But this is obviously not a family group because we don't want the brother and sister to mate. That would, be, that would result in, ex in excessive inbreeding. So, our plan in 1990 was to remove the male, the brother, the older brother from this group and insert another male. And B3 genetically was very compatible with this young female, LA5. We tried to reintroduce B3 in the forest. We took him right up near LA5 and these two youngsters. We released him. And I really did not know whether B3 would approach LA5, whether LA5 would approach B3, and if they did get close together, whether they, whether they would begin to form a bond. And indeed, we know now, with our experience, that this has happened. This introduction accomplished the two goals of creating a new breeding group in the wild and testing a new technique for reintroducing zoo-born animals into a wild group. In addition to being a refuge for golden lion tamarins, Poso de Santos is a center of conservation for the area. Research teams also survey local populations of other animals, and scientists test the latest reforestation techniques. Researchers attempt to determine the exact number of wild tamarins and where they are living.
The work done by zoo researchers to help facilitate the reintroduction process for tamarins is a vital component of the project's success. Dr. Andrew Baker has done work instrumental in helping us learn about the social organization of tamarind groups. His studies examine the transfer of tamarins between families or social groups and the role of caregivers within the social groups. Important work is also being done by Dr. Alfred Rosenberger, who is studying the movement patterns of tamarins. Tamarins born in the wild move about much more easily than tamarins born in captivity, and the results of Dr. Rosenberger's work may help zookeepers better train golden lion tamarins slated for reintroduction. First, I would like to take the Brookfield group and reintroduce it. After a few days, the newly structured Brookfield group seemed to be getting along well, so the reintroduction team prepared for its release. The release is designed to take place early in the morning after the animals have been fed, which allows for a full day of observation after the reintroduction to ensure that all is going well. On January 15, 1991, the group was once again secured in its nest box, this for the final time. Because all usable habitat within the reserve has been occupied by wild and reintroduced tamarins, a site was identified outside the reserve. A local farmer agreed to leave a hilltop on his property undisturbed so that a golden lion tamarind group could be reintroduced there. This is where Celia, Maud, Melvin, and the new male, S6, will live. Oh, man, watch out. Snake. The forest is full of hidden dangers for the tamarins to avoid. With the snake out of the immediate area, preparations continue. The nest box is secured in the tree. A feeder, which the tamarins have grown accustomed to using, is the next to be raised. Finally, the nest box is opened. Opa, I scan the box. Who's going to be right about this? Ah, for Nobody was correct. <laughs> As they emerge, each animal looks skyward, possibly checking for aerial predators. Agora cinco que vem aí, ó. Cinco. He grabbed a dead brain. And this is where locomotion, locomotor competence begins to affect orientation. Okay, here comes a good test of the
We've reintroduced now 90 Golden Lion Tamarins, and right now, 35 of those survive in the wild. Some have to be fed every day. Some are totally self-sufficient. Those reintroduced monkeys have given birth to 45 live offspring, of which 33 are still alive today. And some of those have reproduced themselves. So we have second generation births. In the coming months, the Brookfield Group will be provided with food and monitored closely by reintroduction team observers. Socially, the group is cohesive, and it will face many of the same challenges and hardships as wild tamarins. The wild tamarins are half starved. They're infested with endoparasites. They don't have veterinary care. They don't have reliable food sources. They're subjected to wet, cold nights. Uh, there are predators stalking them every minute. It's not paradise at all. Reintroduced golden lion tamarins will always be new immigrants, strangers to the forest. Their offspring, born into the forest, are the hope for the future of golden lion tamarins. The future success of the reintroduction project also depends on the cooperation and enthusiastic support of the local population. Most responsible for enlisting the support of the people and the first education specialist at Poso de Santos is Luann Dietz. Um, by ex taking advantage of that interest that people had in learning about the tamarins, um, we could tell them about the forest in their region, explain to them that, that the golden lion tamarin only exists in their region, and create some local pride, which was really missing. And, and people began to then value that those small habitat fragments in this region as something that exists nowhere else in the world. Uh, to have reintroduction to conserve species, we have to have habitat. And who does that are local people. We involved them in planning the, the actual project so that our activities would be appropriate in a language that was understandable, et cetera, and be viewed as something that was these people's own and that they could continue in the future. Luann Dietz enlisted the help of local biologists and educators to help create awareness of the forest ecosystem by focusing on the golden lion tamarin. Together with local conservation organizations, they produced public service announcements for television about forest conservation and golden lion tamarins. Fora das matas, ele morre. O mico leão dourado é protegido por lei federal. As a result of these initiatives, a play, The Tamarin Trickster, was produced by the children in the program. The theme for the anniversary parade of Silva Jardim, a town neighboring Poso de Santos, was forest conservation, and the star was the golden lion tamarin. <laughs> One of the students whose school was visited by Luan Dietz was Antonio Quirez, the son of a local farmer. Like many other farmers in the area, the Quirez family owns hilltops that are still good forest. Since tamarins fill the limited usable habitat within the Poso de Santos Reserve, securing privately owned land for reintroductions is vital and today is one of the goals of the Education Center. Antonio Quirez is the farmer on whose land the Brookfield Group was released. He talks about why forest conservation is important to him. It is a matter of the environment. We have regular rains here, and I believe it is because of the forest. We live here. We depend on this land to live. If everybody takes away from it, it is not only the animals or the land who will suffer. We depend on this forest. This is not a pastime for us. We don't live in Ipanema or Copacabana. We live here. Therefore, we have to preserve it. There is also my nephew. 
if the devastation continues like this, there won't be enough for us or for the future. This farmer's small hilltop, containing a few zoo-born monkeys, represents a major success of the Golden Lion Tamarind Conservation Project. Antonio Quirez is one of many residents of the region who now is an active participant in the conservation of the forest ecosystem. With proper medical care and diet, the life expectancy of captive golden lion tamarinds is about 10 to 12 years. Some time has passed since the reintroduction of the Brookfield Group to the forest in Brazil. The day after the reintroduction, observers were unable to locate Melvin. He is presumed to have died. On September 10, 1991, nine months after the reintroduction, Maud was found with an injured and infected leg. She was taken to reserve headquarters where she was given antibiotics. Once her wounds healed, she was paired with a male and released into the forest. Seven months later, Maud disappeared. After three days, she was found with predator bites. She recovered from her wounds and was paired with another male who had two juvenile offspring. The hope is that Maud will bear offspring of her own. On October 18, 1991, Marty's mate gave birth to healthy twins who will be veterans of the forest. These offspring will bring Flash and Celia's genes to the wild population. Celia survived a year in the forest with S6, but on January 13, 1992, she aborted two near-term fetuses, and she died the next day. Flash remains paired with a female at National Zoo and is doing well. Although we're sad to have lost Melvin and Celia, Celia in particular had a long and very productive life here at the zoo, and I'm sure that her presence contributed substantially to the stability of the Brookfield group in the early days of reintroduction. We know now that the captive population is critical for support and long-term existence of the wild population, as is securing additional habitat for that population. Brookfield is going to continue to play a role in both captive and wild conservation of the golden lion tamarind. In the near future, we'll be getting a male and a female to pair. Hopefully, they'll produce offspring. They'll go out on the zoo grounds with their offspring, and we'll sort of have a boot camp where they learn the techniques for surviving in the forest. And after that, we'll go back to the forest of Brazil as a part of Brookfield's continued support for the golden lion tamarind project. The hope for the long-term success of the Golden Lion Tamarind Conservation Project rests with the young. The young born to reintroduced Golden Lion Tamarinds. The young residents of the Atlantic Coastal Rainforest. The young who are the promise for the future. <laughs>